Hello, everyone, and welcome to OCAL's Respiratory Hazards webinar. This webinar will be recorded in order to share online in the future. To ensure we capture a clear and concise webinar, we have muted all microphones and ask that you remain muted throughout the presentation. Please submit your questions in the chat box or wait until we open the floor to questions at the end of the presentation. We appreciate your respect and consideration. Thank you. So welcome again, everybody. This is our first WebEx uh, webinar in the Ottawa Clinic of Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers. And today, again, we're going to be speaking about respiratory hazards. Um, I am Kimberly O'Connell. I am the Executive Director at the Eastern and Northern Regions of the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers, and I'm also an occupational hygienist by trade. I'm joined by a couple of other hygienists in our clinic, Kevin Hedges and Todd Eirich, and we're going to uh, uh, without further ado, get going with our day. Great. So um, we're, we're talking about respiratory hazards because um, this month is Lung Cancer Awareness Month um, and uh, the Ministry of Labour Training and Skills Development is having an initiative called the Healthy Workers in Healthy Workplaces. And we're going to speak more about that, but really why? And it's due to all of our efforts um, out there and, and we're calling you to action uh, around preventing occupational disease. So the numbers are staggering um, with regard to, th to this, um, uh, you know, the cause uh, and effect of occupational exposures of various kinds in the workplace. Um, 154 occupational disease deaths in Ontario compared to 72 traumatic fatalities through the day of morning fatalities report. Uh, and th these numbers are only increasing. Uh, they've outnumbered traumatic fatalities over the past 10 years and, and really just, just going up, leading diseases resulting in deaths, mesothelioma, lung cancer. Um, and these are only the reported um, and, and uh, accepted stats that we have. Um, they're all significantly lagging indicators as we've indicated, plus many, many deaths and illnesses go unrecognized unreported and are not allowed. Um, so really, we'd like to, uh, to to call to you to help us do something about um, occupational disease and join us in our action plan. Um, so the, I'd like to start by kind of giving you background to uh, the Healthy, work, Healthy Workplace Initiative um, and the Respiratory Hazards Working Group um, by talking a little bit about the Occupational Disease Action Plan in Ontario. So selected this group of um, system partners um, here in, in this slide, uh, all collaborated uh, and selected priority exposures of noise, diesel engine exhaust, allergens and irritants, and developed activities for the action plan across a wide range of prevention approaches, including research and data, education and training, and enforcement and awareness. And working groups uh, were were set out, uh, including an intelligence and decision support working group to help drive um, our actions um, and uh, a in electronic medical record working group, um, which actually drove up to the interministerial level, which simply uh, have the goal of trying to have your physicians, um, when you go to your family physician, ask what occupation or where you spend most of your day uh, breathing in, um, uh, you know, and, and what you do um, through most of your, your work day. Um, and that ha again has between the Minister of uh, Health and the Minister of Labor, um, that working group is, is uh, working at that level now. Um, so we have a noise working group, a diesel uh, exhaust working group, but there were other priorities identified uh, were general oc disease awareness and research on emerging exposures, which is the engineered nanomaterials. So the implementation of ODAP was assigned to these working groups um, and staffed by interested implementation team members or by their delegates. Um, so that partnership with the uh, you know, Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care and, and Ontario MD are, are beginning discussions around inclusion of occupational data in medical records. 
Um, and as you can see with the asterisks, what we're talking about today is the addition of the respiratory hazards working group, which we're, we're also, um, and we're also gonna hear from the diesel exhaust working group and the nanotechnology working group. So there were, again, consensus that there was a general lack of awareness among health and safety system and workplace parties when it came to occupational disease issue that needed to be addressed. So they agreed to um, prioritize through ranking these exposures that would result in off disease. Uh, in cases where high volumes of workers are exposed, uh, where short term outcomes are attainable and measurable, and we had capacity or opportunity existed for intervention. Um, so these new collaborative initiatives uh, didn't want to lose sight of emerging exposures, as I mentioned, um, and they they wanted to recommend uh, where prevention efforts should be focused based on severity and prevalence research. Um, so all of these system partners from research to health and safety associations uh, to the Workers' Health and Safety Centre, our, ourselves at OCAO, uh, chairing um, the Occupational Disease Action Plan, the WSIB, um, and prevention, and even bringing in um, public health, the Ontario Lung Association, and in some cases you'll hear in the other working groups, in, um, you know, even federal participation or leading edge um, best practice uh, participation. So that's the background to the Occupational Disease Action Plan, and a couple of our, um, I did want to highlight a couple of um, uh, main I guess, tools that have been developed with CCOHS um, together with OCAL, um, the Prevent Oct Disease website, which you'll hear about again later on in the presentation, um, which is a sort of a por portal for all um, information about oc occupational disease prevention. And we want you to be part of this. So I'll click to that a little bit later on and I'll, you'll hear all about nanotechnology from Todd, who chairs that working group a little later on as well. But we are particularly proud of the partnership with CCOHS on these products. Um, the Respiratory Hazards Working Group um, really was established um, to build or leverage on this Healthy Workers in Healthy Workplaces initiative that was coming from the Ministry of Labor, Training and Skills Development. And this working group just got started in the summer and uh, I chair that working group with the Prevention Office and uh, of the Ministry of Labor and Skills and, uh, sorry, Training and Skills Development. It's a new title from the MOL uh, for so many years of us saying MOL. Um, so we're hoping to add priority substances to this group of um, priorities that we've been working on with ODAP to include asbestos silica, and of course, pull in all the great work of the diesel exhaust emissions working group, um, isocyanates and cleaning products and paints and solvents pulling in from the allergens and irritants working group. Um, so the activities to date of this uh, working group were to perform an environmental scan and inventory all the resources from all of those system partners that I, I showed you uh, around these priority substances and we uploaded the, these to the Prevent Oc Disease website. We've had presentations on this material and now this webinar in various er areas around the province, uh, as have a lot of the other health and safety associations. And we're building on awareness raising um, from the Healthy Workers and Healthy Workplaces initiative that I'm about to tell you about. There are amended regulations coming up in January um, that we're hoping to help um, support uh, and by hoping to our opportunities working ahead, um, again, providing tools and practices for risk assessment and hazard control around respiratory protection. So here's a little bit more about the Healthy Workers and Healthy Workplaces um, initiative. Um, and the, the visual for the, the following slides really is um, an infographic um, and a toolkit, um, which has been, um, it is posted, um, as you can see on the links provided by each of the health and safety associations. Um, so that was a, a collaborative effort that was driven out of um, uh, the prevention office um, and also with all the health and safety associations and supported by the respiratory hazards working group. So what is this healthy workers and healthy workplaces initiative? So this is a, uh, in the older terms a blitz that will be happening from the Ministry of Labor uh, Training and Skills Development. 
Um, and what will they be looking for? Well, when they go, um, they, you know, it's a, a two-phased approach where there's compliance assistance for workplaces, uh, followed by um, the, the BLITZ program. So when inspectors uh, arrive in construction areas, they'll be looking at gases, dusts, and vapors, uh, and fumes that may be present um, on these construction projects. So particularly around silica dust from cutting and breaking, uh, they'll be looking for friable asbestos being disturbed or removed, uh, dust and vapors associated with hardwood floor installation and finishing, uh, solvent vapors, as you can see from paint strippers, cleaning, cleaners, coatings, adhesives, um, isocyanates from spray foam uh, insulation and certain spray paints, uh, carbon monoxide from operation of heaters on equipment, uh, fumes and vapors from heated asphalt and roofing and, and road paving operations. In healthcare, uh, they'll be looking uh, for hazards related to cleaning agents specifically, but also be checking for asbestos containing materials. Um, they'll be looking at whether you have training programs in place on these cleaning agents and preservatives. In addition, uh, for hospitals, they'll be looking for written measures and procedures on safe work practices for the use of antiseptics, disinfectants, and decontaminants. And they'll, they'll also be looking at PPE. Um, and a lot of the regulatory changes coming up um, in January that we'll talk a little bit about skim the surface and we may have another webinar on the regulatory changes uh, coming up. Um, do have to do with per personal protective equipment and its limitations and where to use the correct type of personal protective equipment or respiratory protection and how um, and of course uh, asbestos in general. Um, industrial uh, folks will be looking, uh, inspectors will be looking at again crystalline silica welding fumes and diesel exhaust exposures. So um, th these they'll be looking for assessments and control programs, what measures and procedures you have in place. Um, if you're monitoring, doing exposure monitoring for workers uh, and whether or not you have medical surveillance. Um, and your use of personal protective equipment and respirators, again, and the training associated with that. In mining, inspectors will be focusing on um, the hazards related to underground diesel equipment, and they're going to be looking for assessment and control programs in place for the designated substances of, for example, silica dust, uh, for example, silica. <laughs> Um, and they'll be looking at maintenance uh, of underground diesel equipment. Um, they'll be looking at dilution ventilation to prevent worker exposure. Um, they'll be looking at testing diesel emissions and diesel particulate matter. And you're going to hear a lot more about um, the diesel piece from Kevin Hedges shortly uh, as the chair of the diesel exhaust emissions working group. So that is the Healthy Workers and Healthy Workplaces initiative um, that's happening um, through the till December 27th. Um, and again, sort of where uh, the respiratory hazards uh, working group came into a, uh, play. There is another working group involved and, and Dr. Lynn Holness uh, couldn't be here in Ottawa, uh, but she allowed us to use her slide um, to discuss the allergens and irritants working group. Um, and it, the accomplishments of this group were they, they really uh, did some uh, they determine their priorities from an initial review of literature, creation of background documents um, for the suggested options, uh, and input from international experts. Um, then the working group went through a prioritization process similar to what was used by the Occupational Disease Action Plan implementation team to establish their overall uh, priorities. So the background documents for those selected priorities were customized for each sector uh, based on the health and safety uh, uh, associations and they're posted on the CREOD and prevent Oc disease websites that we've discussed and are being used as reference material for um, this healthy worker and healthy workplace initiative with the Ministry of Labor um, training and skills development on respiratory hazards. In addition, there were three fact sheets on the prevention of skin disease topics specific for cleaners and were developed and posted as well. Um, analysis of five years of patch test data um, from uh, St. Mike's Hospital Clinic has provided a snapshot of prevention activities in the workplace and also most common work related allergens and this information has been examined by sector and also by several job categories. 
So the current work of this group um, is that they're looking at the, the analysis of the St. Mike's Hospital patch test database is being extended to seven years. Um, in addition, they have over 20 years of data from the North American contact dermatitis group that will provide more granular information on occupational relevant allergens by sector and job. Um, and CREOD researchers have received funding to develop an e-learning module uh, for the prevention of early detection of dermatitis in healthcare workers. And this will leverage the Public Health Ontario project that has just completed a systematic review. Uh, they're going to be developing further resources, uh, for example, uh, with the new designated substance medical surveillance codes coming into effect in January. Um, and the Algin Dinerton's working group will develop a set of fact sheets related to isocyanate medical surveillance. Um, one sheet for the worker, the workplace, and the healthcare provider. So before I pass over to uh, Kevin uh, with the Diesel Exhaust Emissions Working Group, I just wanted to talk about our next steps for the Respiratory Hazards Working Group. And really, uh, we just started this work. So we we wanted to support the Healthy Workers and Healthy Workplaces Initiative, uh, but we, we wanted to, uh, our longer term plans, we're still uh, etching those out um, to follow along with the, the logic model or the objectives of the Occupational Disease Action Plan Group. Um, but we want to be working on surveillance and exposure data. And I did want to uh, send kudos or uh, inform uh, people that um, the Occupational Cancer Research Center uh, and led by Paul Demers um, recently had a, a, you know, a national exposure disease surveillance workshop um, where they had participants from all over Canada. Uh, so British Columbia, Quebec, Saskatchewan, um, the, the Fed set with the Veterans Affairs Canada, um, U University of Calgary, and really everyone l looking together at how we advance um, an occupational disease and exposure agenda for Canada itself. Um, so uh, stay tuned for reports from, from that meeting and what future collaborations on OC disease surveillance could look like. Um, we also, as a working group with respiratory hazards, want to focus on control tools. Uh, so we actually had a meeting where uh, Hugh Davies from UBC uh, and um, the BC Construction Safety Association came to tell us about a silica control tool that they have um, developed in BC um, that we're looking at as a group. Um, and we want more and more of these tools to, to find workplaces. Um, yes, it's about recognize, assess, control, um, and uh, and there are regulatory changes to tell you about as well. But I'm running out a bit of a time. But we really would like to focus on uh, on the control piece. Uh, we know that some of these uh, contaminants cause harm. Um, not you can't always uh, you know mom and pop shops can't always do um, have easy access to. Um, error monitoring, but why can't we use similar exposure information and, and start tracking data and, and start controlling where we know there's a hazard. Um, so I, I, I did want to let you know, again, just a slide on the modernization to the occupational health regulations coming. And I think we will commit to having another webinar uh, on this um, because, it, you know, there, it's coming down the pipe and we'll have more on the respiratory hazards about them. But they, they will replace the nine separate medical surveillance codes with one single consolidated medical surveillance code um, and the 16 separate codes for respiratory equipment and measuring airborne substance with new updated consolidated respiratory protection and measuring provisions. Uh, and then we, they, uh, they are going to permit businesses to use the Quebec model for calculating exposure to hazardous substances for irregular work shifts. And stay tuned as part of that respiratory hazards group and the tools we'd like to develop. Um, we, we are looking into creating um, uh, a tool uh, with the creator of the Quebec model uh, for Ontario. Um, and of course, the most exciting um, is that the, uh, uh, the addition of substitution or substituting hazardous substances, those that are less hazardous in the hierarchy of controls, right in are the regs finally with this modernization. So I'd like to now pass um, over to Kevin to talk to you more about the, the diesel exhaust emissions working group. Thank you, Kimberly, and good after afternoon, everyone. And thanks so much for dialing in to um, this webinar. Um, and I, I've really only got about 15 minutes just to give you a snapshot 
on workings of the diesel working group. So really, I just want to try and bring some science to the presentation, um, just to raise your awareness. And please um, have a closer look at my presentation and maybe watch some of the more detailed um, YouTube videos that I point you to. Just start to think about the hazards associated with diesel exhaust. So we do have a working group. And what we're trying to do is we're actually, we bring broad experts um, to our working group. We're also looking at research um, that's happening. And we're also trying to understand really uh, good practices. And we're looking at from an, inter from an international perspective. And we're also bringing in um, from an environmental health and public health perspective as well. And I just want to quickly talk about why um, diesel exhaust is such a big deal. Um, there's been a plethora of research out there and the, the awareness is really raising in this sort of area. Um, and if you think about air pollution, um, there's 4.2 million premature deaths worldwide um, um, per year and that was in 2016. So cardiovascular um, uh, disease is a big issue as well. And um, there's a lot of people actually um, dying because of exposure to air pollution. And if you think about the costs of air pollution, they're exorbitant, um, 67 to 80 billion um, in EU 28. And about 75% of these costs are attributable to diesel exhaust, and I'll let you know why. Um, so this is just talking about diesel sorry, total air pollution ranking for the global risk factors for the to total numbers of deaths in 2017. And as you will see, like it's um, the air pollution is the fifth leading risk factor for mortality worldwide. Um, it is responsible for more deaths than many better known risk factors, such as malnutrition, alcohol use and physical inactivity. And each year, more people die from air pollution related disease than from road traffic injuries or malaria. And I guess the issue with diesel exhaust is because of um, really the uh, how it differs from other kinds of emissions, uh, for, like from gasoline powered vehicles, for example, are the ultrafines that are actually pumped out into the atmosphere. Think about looking out and to the atmosphere, looking, you know, um, your daily life, commuting, for example, on the train, seeing um, fume come from stacks, from trains and trucks. And I've actually uh, just provided a, um, a visual there of uh, what these particles look like um, at a microscopic level. And just um, if you think about these ultrafines that are less than 100 nanometers in diameter, it's extremely small, um, passing in through the bloodstream into and then reaching different organs um, throughout the body. And if you think about the number of people who are exposed in industry, um, you'll see that there's, it's across the board, there's lots of different industry sectors here that are exposed and um, obviously mining, um, the, the highest levels of exposure, but there's a smaller number of workers in mining, but it is a very important issue for, for workplaces. Um, and this is out of the uh, burden of occupational cancer report from OCRC, the Occupational Cancer Research Center. If you think about um, Canada and you think about how many exposed, there's about a, they, they, rec they estimate about 897,000 workers are exposed. And they've predicted that there's about 560 lung cancers per year and 200 bladder cancers per year. Um, and I guess over the years, and I've actually seen this happen because I've been following this issue for many years, there's been quite a bit of lobbying by, um, by industry uh, collaborators to obstruct the science and repress the science. Um, from the National Cancer Institute and the National Institute for Occupational Health and Safety, which is very unfortunate that that's been repressed for so long. But now we're in a position where there, you know, the evidence is strong and the science can no longer be repressed. And um, 
One leading company, BHP, has actually gone, it's a multinational mining um, petroleum company and, and global minerals company. It's got a, they set a target to, to lower exposure to diesel particulate, particulate as low as technically feasible. So they've gone beyond any regulatory requirements. Um, and the Occupational Cancer Research Center is, is recommending um, quite low limits as well. Uh, there was um, a letter from the Ministry of Labor and they were proposing um, a limit uh, for all workplaces. And it was for the first time in Canada ever that this limit would be applied for all workplaces for diesel particulate matter. But this limit is actually based on an American mining limit. And really, we've got to ask the question, is the proposed limit low enough? And uh, there's a very uh, interesting meta-analysis carried out by a researcher called Rolf Vermeulen, where he actually pulled to different, together different studies. And what this implies is that if this limit that's proposed from the Ministry of Labor in Ontario was adopted, um, you know, for a, say a 15 to 25 year exposure period, it means that we can end up with um, twice or two times the greater than two times the relative risk so double the risk of getting lung cancer compared to background and um, is that acceptable and you know really when you think about the research emerging and the findings emerging it also paves the way for uh, future compensation claims for example lung cancer and bladder cancer so, you know, what about construction diesel engines, including those used in tunneling? What about older engines? Um, the effect, the health effects of exposure to diesel exhaust in power trains, for example. Um, here's a study that's come from um, Copenhagen, where actually um, you got participants to ride on train carriages behind the engine for three consecutive days. They were measuring exposure, and even on the locomotives, they were seeing um, health effects from these shorter term exposures. And uh, this is just uh, something that's come from um, Professor Greg Evans from the University of Toronto, that even in trains that there is a uh, risk to both workers and possibly to commuters. This is also a study that's come out from um, Belgium where they've actually looked at um, pregnant um, women and pregnant women living close to traffic pollution and pregnant women living further away from traffic pollution. What they've actually found is um, they found um, black carbon can actually cross the placenta and reach the unborn child. And if you think about uh, what the Netherlands have actually uh, recommending now, they're recommending very, very low um, limits as well, which is, is orders of magnitude with what exists currently. So I guess I just put it back. Our regular is setting occupational exposure limits at low enough levels to drive continuous improvement. Um, you know, so we have higher tier engines, battery powered vehicles, and we can install diesel particulate filters. And there's a really strong um, point here that we really need to think about the internal responsibility system and the precautionary principle approach, just not to rely on a legal limit because it's not going to be protective enough. Uh, Workplace Safety North, which are a partner of ODAP and uh, they're on the working group, have provided uh, freely available training material on the web and there's a hyperlink um, here and I you know if you don't do anything else from this uh, webinar other than watch this YouTube video um, where uh, Dr. Cheryl Peters and Paul Demers has presented on the, um, the hazards of uh, diesel exposure in workplaces I, I beg you to actually both watch this um, video and also share it. So I've just um, really given you a snapshot of uh, the way forward, uh, oh, sorry, of, of the workings of the Diesel Working Group. 
and also talked about uh, international practices. So there's also another YouTube video here that's provided by Dr. Rob McDonald. He's a corporate advisor with BHP and the BHP are actually going way below any low, uh, legal limit internationally. So there's another YouTube video that I'd like you to watch. I'm just gonna now hand you on to Todd, Mo, uh, Todd Eric, who is gonna be talk about, talking about nanomaterials. Thanks, Kevin and Kimberly and everyone uh, for joining. Um, so my name is Todd Eirich. I'm a, a hygienist along with Kevin here in the Eastern Ontario Clinic and um, have an interest in uh, the emerging issue of um, nanomaterials and potential adverse health effects. Um, it's been emerging almost as long as my pretty close to 30 year career, but it still is kind of at the forefront because um, there is some controversy and, and some uncertainty around things. But the guiding principle, as Kevin just mentioned, is the precautionary principle. So when there's the risk or chance of serious health outcomes um, with, uh, you know, we don't wait for further research um, to kind of completely confirm things. We take prudent and uh, precautionary measures um, in light of the fact that there could very well be uh, some serious consequences here. And also, as Kevin mentioned, um, there are examples of uh, nanomaterials in, in the world that aren't fabricated or engineered by people. Um, for uh, as long as the earth has been around, um, there have been natural sources such as volcanoes, forest fires, ocean sprays, and um, as, and again, a, a, uh, a nanomaterial is essentially defined as, as something uh, less than 100 nanometers. Um, and, and for the people that are, you know, know about microns or micrometers, that's a thousand times smaller than a, than a micrometer. And it's in the order of where viruses and biomolecules are, um, you know, that kind of size. So these are very tiny things. Um, and, and uh, in addition to the natural sources, um, things that diesel fits into the category of incidental, so combustion engines, uh, incinerators, jet engines, and welding all have, um, and ultrafine is another kind of synonym that, that people will use for uh, particles of this um, very small dimension. So the engineered ones are the ones that, we're, that I'm gonna be concentrating on and uh, you see some pictures down there. You know, these things can be very beautiful when, when you look at them and they're very useful. Um, they're providing a tremendous benefit to society, whether it's through, you know, carrying anti-cancer agents or um, used at antiseptics. Uh, but, you know, um, 50 years ago, there were several wonder materials, uh, you know, including asbestos that were given the same kind of names uh, in terms of their benefits to society. And really um, what I see in, in this and some other emerging areas is the, um, it has technology is going so fast that we're not really able to keep up with what the potential ramifications are on the, on the health effects side. On the left, you see some uh, zinc oxide nanowires on a polymeric microsphere. These are used in um, photo uh, optoelectronic uh, solar cells, that sort of thing. On the right, another quite beautiful um, picture of a blue indium uh, nano droplet um, and uh, surrounded by uh, silica green nano strands. And these are used um, in, uh, as negative electrodes in lithium ion batteries. So these things are being used and fabricated and they're uh, pervasive throughout. Um, and there are some health concerns. Uh, so why this is pertinent to today's topic of respiratory, for sure they can be inhaled and deposited in the respiratory tract. Um, this, this is a fairly classic picture that, that I remember seeing at a NIOSH workshop probably about 15 years ago. 
of a carbon nanotube penetrating out of the lung surface in the pleural space. And um, there is, uh, you know, an IR classification for a particular uh, type of, of carbon, the multi-walled multi nanotube. Um, and uh, you know the 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 aspect ratio uh, that's of importance in in uh, fiber toxicity like asbestos is, uh, is can be seen in some of these engineered nanomaterials. Um, and as Kevin showed so nicely graphically in that in that picture um, of the paper like of the uh, translocation going through to other parts of the body. Um, crossing the placental um, barrier uh, and um, even migrating along the olfactory nerve into the brain. And then and there's been research and, and indications that this sort of thing is happening. And certain nanotubes cause rapid and permanent uh, persistent pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, it's important to note that it, it, not all nanomaterials are the same, uh, depending on the chemical nature as well as the morphological shape uh, size, um, there's a wide variety and vast difference in toxicities uh, amongst the nanomaterials. There's also a tremendous amount of uh, this. I, at the end, I've given you some uh, website uh, resources, and this this one uh, is is Stat Nano. It's um, it shows uh, people can register themselves as producing nanomaterial, uh, you know, products that contain nanomaterials. And right now, there's uh, there's close to 9,000 products, and, uh, um, over 2,000 companies, and over 50 countries, and um, you know everything ranging from cosmetics. So you can see this woman here with the uh, the split face. So she's got um, macro zinc oxide on the uh, on the, on her side that's white and then the other side is nano zinc oxide it can it does the same thing in terms of blocking out the sun uh you know if you're a lifeguard or whatever um or worker out in the field um and it just uh but it but it's you know cosmetically pleasing um it, it's worthy of note that that there are der potential dermal implications with with nanomaterials as well as inhalation so I guess, uh, yeah, and, and auto industry, um, there's paint that when you scratch it, it automatically repairs itself overnight because it's got nanoparticles in it. Um, those, the nanoparticles not only change uh, with their functionality, of what they, um, but they're also their physical appearance. So silver nanoparticles are actually brown and they become antiseptic um, agents. So you'll find them in socks, Medical garments, respirators, um, all kinds of things that you don't you want to inhibit bacterial growth have nanomaterials. And of course, as we know from things like asbestos, it's not the you know non uh, friable or releasable materials, but a sock uh, could become brittle over years and eventually release the particles. So it's it's, it's there's a lot of analogies with uh, to me with with uh, asbestos in terms of potential exposures. Clearly, the, the the number one issue is when they, where these materials are actually being made um, in in the manufacturing facility where you've got human occupational exposures. Then they make it into products where um, you know again workers can be exposed during the production of these products and consumers. And then uh, of course there's environmental um, implications as well. So um, what about, so let's go get into a few nuts and bolts on um, when you're working with these things, where are the, the, the biggest issues, uh, of course, are with powders, but you can, the liquid media can be aerosolized, you can have skin uh, potential exposures, and uh, certainly when there's any kind of mechanical disruption, um, when you're handling the powders, um, and you can even generate um, uh, gas phase in, in non-enclosed systems. Um, always, as as always, remember um, maintenance procedures and processes, as well as cleaning up spills or waste materials can be potential exposures, um, and certainly uh, cleaning air handling or duct uh, systems. Now I've lost my, uh, I can't advance it. <clears throat> okay, great. 
Thanks. You'll you'll note um, anyone who's been in the business for a while, there's nothing really all that new here. Um, the same things that are good for um, highly toxic particulates, whether it be a HEPA filter or a safety cabinet, uh, local exhaust ventilation. Um, you know, the good news is a P100 respirator um, will is pretty effective against um, uh, nanoparticles as it is uh, in particles in the micron range. Um, elimination substitution, yes, uh, those are always, as Kim, that's, Kimberly mentioned, that's going to be one of the um, hierarchy controls. Um, in all, in many cases, though, with nanomaterials and new material, like you're, the whole point of you using them is because you're trying something new. So um, it's it's a little that one's a little bit tough, but definitely switch from uh, powders. Use wet methods. Uh, you know, use liquids instead when you can, and training and and uh, PPE control banding in the absence of um, occupational exposure limits. There's been a few efforts at at determining. You know, NIOSH has set a couple of uh, gravimetric weight based limits, but the the trend now is towards uh, particle concentrations per per volume of air, and uh, you, you'll probably will probably be seeing some emerging guidelines or numbers. Right now, it's pretty much a look at background and try to keep it uh, below background. This um, you won't be able to read more than likely, but as cat like print it off. Um, go to the NIOSH website. This is a, I, anybody that has nanomaterials in the workplace. It'd be great to see this on your health and safety board because it's very clear and concise instructions for uh, dry powders, liquids, and physically encapsulated, gives the, you know, the, the types of work activities associated with it and, and the engineering, administrative, and protective equipment. So this is an excellent uh, summary. One of the, th the things that we did um, in, Kimberly mentioned ODAP and, and the emerging issues is we thought this would be a good opportunity to get a group of people from um, labor, from the uh, health and safety agencies, the provincial uh, associations, and um, and experts in in the field of of nanotechnology and health. Um, the, there's two CSA standards that I'm going to show you at the end, and essentially the the core of this group was the with technical. Uh, committee for those two CSA standards and um, you know they could be from Health Canada we've got people from the National Research Council as well as the Ministry of Labor and various other uh, uh, organizations so we're trying to um, we're trying to get identify methods uh, specific industries um, where where these things are produced how do we prioritize uh, like the most vulnerable people? Um, how are we going to communicate to these groups? And uh, and and then eventually we'd like to we'd like to see how you know if there's any um, kind of impact there's been on the work that we've done. So uh, for now we have um, Kimberly, Kimberly mentioned the e course and that was kind of our first. Uh, um, activity, we, well, first of all, we tried to find out, like get a list or a spreadsheet or something of everybody that uses them, that, that site that said 9,000 people in 50 countries. And, and it's a real challenge because it's not just what people like at a GM plant, um, they're importing stuff from China, right? So it's, it's really hard to get a hold on where all these things are. So that we said, why don't we just try to blitz out there with some awareness? CCOHS has been doing that for years. They're great at it. So we, we partnered with them. And and got buy-in from all the different groups um, of of the, you know that I, that I suggested, with which can have a quite a diverse group of opinions on what you know level of risk and what ought to be done. So we came to a consensus. Then there's a 20-minute e-course. I'll show you the um, the website uh, in a minute. And um, yeah, then the next one was an infographic with CCOHS, which we just uh, pr pr um, developed last year. And uh, we're working on a podcast or podcast that should be coming um, by March. So here's our infographic. You can find it on the CCOHS website. Basically says where they are, what you can do, what workplaces can do, health effects. And uh, it's all in one page. And again, you can post that at your health and safety board. The e-course is a 20 minute 
um, online. No, fr no, it's it's an awareness course, so it's free. And we are tracking the hits so that we can use that as some of the data to uh, like where these materials are actually being used. So you can get both of the infographic and the e-course through the CCOHS website. So in summary, I'm going to say, um, you know, identification and awareness is required. Although the health effects are not fully known, there's enough to support the precautionary principle, and we've got widespread agreement on that at all levels of government and regulators and everything else. Uh, ensure that your products and process are identified um, and provide awareness and training. And the two uh, CSA standards are really good uh, documents that anybody should have that's got nanomaterials in their workplace. So pick those up and use a whole bunch of resources that are out there. Okay, so please uh, we, uh, use the chat window to type in any questions that you have. Uh, so Donna's asking if the presentation will be available through the site. The OCA website? Yes, um, the, we are recording and we'll be posting the presentation I, I can't tell you the mechanism if it's through Eventbrite um, or posted on the site. I, I will get back. I can get back to you with the details of that. But yes, we're recording and we'll be posting if that's possible. It may just be through Eventbrite. I'm not sure. Uh, so someone is asking, is there an agency that can speak to staff at a company about the hazards of sense in the workplace? Order of sense. Yeah, yeah, every, uh, I, I guess any consultant or any health, uh, health and safety association or ourselves, uh, the Workers Health and Safety Center, um, any of the same resources uh, that have been uh, discussed around respiratory hazards uh, would be able to have uh, that capability. So Francis asks, when looking at diesel exhaust underground, are you looking at clean air versus dirty air for considering uh, any volumes? Okay, I'm not really sure that I understand the question. Um, when you, we're looking at diesel exhaust underground, are we looking at clean air? Repeat the question. Yeah, when looking at diesel exhaust underground, are you looking at clean air versus dirty air for considering same volumes? And ultimately, um, I'm just trying to be intuitive here and understand the question because I don't know if I fully understand it. Really, what we're trying to do is we're, we're if you think about diesel exhaust and you think about what's coming out of the Netherlands. And you know the health risks get really, really, really low levels, even towards the level of pollution from traffic, for example. Ultimately, we want to try and get the air at just like background air and get it as low as re as is reasonably achievable. And if you think about um, BHP, they're doing that. They've set a target, but it's only a target of, of, of much lower than legal limits, and then. As time goes on, as the technology improves, then they'll even go lower. And there's been a lot of work to actually replace the diesel engines with electric powered vehicles. So I think it's really important that people understand that there's a, a health risk there at, at current levels and those that health risk is unacceptable. So we're ultimately we're trying to make the air cleaner. I don't know if that's answered the question. Should we open up the mic? Am I able to ask something? Well, Sherry, so not a question, but a comment. Thanks for the session. I'm a first year PhD student focusing on COPD as an occupational hazard with underground mineral, uh, minerals workers in Northern Ontario. I appreciate all of the information as I move forward with my research. Excellent. Sure, we can open up the mics. Sure, we can try it. <laughs> We're going to try opening up the, the mic to see if people are more comfortable with uh, any verbal questions. And if not, we can uh, certainly like, let you get back to your days. So We're unmuting everyone now. 
in that area. So, another question is, are there nanoparticles in ambient air? Yeah. Sure. Ground levels, um, the number right now, and it depends on where you are. Are you on town? You're telling me. That. Are you in the country? But there are natural, from my limited knowledge, and engineered nanoparticles throughout our. Just add, said, um, my presentation, I talked about exposure to ultrafines riding on locomotives that are diesel. They're ultrafine particles. I also talked about um, the translocation of black carbon in through the placenta um, to the fetus. So they're ultrafine particles. So ultrafine particles are present in our atmosphere and it's a public health problem. So, yes, I just wanted to add that. I'm reading Don now. And someone else is asking, where can we find nanomaterials on SDSs? That is a really good question. So um, it, it sounds like we're going to have to mute the lines uh, because uh, opening the microphones is not working. You can hear multiple people unclearly now. So we're going to go back to trying to mute you. Um, so, so you'll have to keep asking your questions. Uh, in the chat room, and I'll let Todd answer the SDS question now. Can, can you hear? Well, I guess they can hear me. I'll go over there. Um, so we have we have a couple of people that have been coming to our our network meetings from Health Canada, and they're the regulators, and they're the ones that are you know kind of overseeing things like you know what what uh, is required in Canada for uh, disclosure. Um, one of the big problems is. Historically, uh, a, a hygienist or a chemist or whatever will use the chemical abstract uh, service number, the CAS number. Well, the CAS number for titanium dioxide nanomaterial and um, non nanomaterial, I'll call it a macro material, are the same. So you can't tell by CAS number. There is work and an effort. Um, to uh, to change this, and but it's on it's ongoing. So for now, you're you're basically you know you have to look at the toxicity information, the section. Uh, the problem is there's not a whole lot of information, like you know, health information on these things. So um, yeah, I, it's it's a really good. I don't have a great answer other than I know there people are working on it, but it's not. We definitely aren't there. You, you you can't necessarily tell just by looking at an SDS that it's got nanomaterial or not. Um, it's gonna it's gonna tell you if uh, it's important for the um, physical properties of the material as it's used in industry, because they'll give you a they'll do a particle size distribution. They'll say you know that we we need this for our product, but not necessarily from the health side. So. Um, uh, there's another question about the elaboration on upcoming health care regulations, especially the time frame. Um, it, not specific to health care, but the updated regulations to the Act, um, including the designated substances uh, and the um, uh, regulation 833 on uh, uh they were made in may uh filed in june uh published to the gazette at the end of june and are coming into effect in january of 2020. now there is another comment um that i don't think is a question but i'll read it uh although i guess you can all see it as the vehicles are tested with closed doors even though they may even though they connect the exhaust to the tubes running outside, I'm sure it's not 100% sent outside. So I think, yes, it's a comment about possible re-entrainment um, of uh, emissions, and it's a, it's a good point. Thank you. Any other questions? Otherwise, we will... Uh, let you go on this uh oh i asked one i'm so sorry uh and does diesel exhaust research include industrial garages and mechanical shops 
the research that I'm aware of has been on locomotives, um, and there's also been research done looking at um, in fire stations and firefighters' exposure. Um, there will be, if we, we did a literature review, I'm sure I could dig out some papers on where they've actually evaluated um, diesel emissions from mechanics. So there have been reports of exposures to diesel emissions from mechanics, but I, I can't think of any research off the top of my head. But if you're interested, I can do a bit of a search and find out um, what research is out there in that area. If there isn't any other questions, then we will sign off this afternoon. Thank you. Have a great day. Have a good afternoon, everyone.